spend much time in Bristol? Are you now? Yeah. No, not a great deal. It, um, since I had kids, I've not been able to see really. So, um, have you been here before? So at the watershed. The watershed. Yeah. Well, I I won the regional final of the BBC New Comedy Awards in this building. It was here. It was in here, and then I and then that was what went on to be. The, uh, the BBC New Comedy Award at Edinburgh that I won that really got me going in comedy. Okay, so, so, it's so yes, it's a special place. <laughs> it's got some significance. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, it's really great to be here because it's um, they do a lot of because it's not just films and stuff. They do all this no talks and all manner of cool things. Yeah, Bristol Ide- Ideas Festival because I think that's just yeah. Started. I just saw the thing out there, the Festival Ideas. Yeah, yeah. 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 So that's all yeah, exciting. Cool. But yeah. you're here for Spam a lot, which is great. So. Because you did it last year, did you? Yeah. Yeah, this was one of the last venues I did before um, before I finished in the tour. I assumed finished for good, and then they asked, would I do it again? And I thought, well, yeah, yeah why not? It's just because it's so brilliant. much fun. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's ridiculously fun. I mean, a script written by the Pythons with music by John Dupre alongside a really brilliant cast of people I mean not only very nice but amazingly talented you know they can all sing and dance like you know here's the tune and they can do top harmony middle harmony bass harmony whatever and dance at the same time and they can all do comedy and they can all do acting you know it's a real it's a real treat so, so, well because we know you can do the comedy but can you can I do, do, do the acting <laughs> well the singing and the dancing and well the singing I've had a lot of help and I am um, it's fine it's fine I mean I, I'm not going to do sort of false modesty and go you know I'm getting away with it or any of that sort of thing it's fine and some nights uh, it's really good uh, it feels brilliant because it's like it's a proper fear for me like I'm te- I've been terrified of singing in public for good reason I've done it very badly <laughs> and uh, so it's been like that thing of being taught to sing or at least told by enough people yes you can and this is how you know it's, I don't know if that's different it feels a little different um, is you know it feels proper that it's really good and the dancing I really enjoy and I'm sort of a bit big and a bit ungainly but I give it a bloody good go <laughs> oh I suppose it's your character as well isn't yeah it? yeah totally, you know. totally and yeah. you were yeah. presumably chosen for the character on that basis yeah. Yeah. and did they spot you doing stand up and then they uh, what happened I, I, I guess they knew you know they knew who I was from various things I'd done radio and telly and whatever and then I did a play in Edinburgh two years ago, School for Scandal. Oh yeah, no, I know. Awful, awful production, basically, <laughs> but uh, not without its redeeming uh, qualities. It was and, like um, a big panther, wasn't it? It was, it was exactly uh, that. Yeah, with Phil Nickel, who was very brilliant, Paul Foot, who was very brilliant, Ella Kenyon, who was very brilliant, uh, Bridget Christie, who was very brilliant. Two wonderful actors who had trained under Gaulier, um the, the, the clown who trained Sasha Baron Cohen uh, and, and Lionel Blair who was um, who was deeply unpleasant um, <laughs> and so the energies were pulling in very different directions and some nights that created a brilliant a, like properly brilliant mad piece of theatre but as often as not it was too many different directions well did I see a thing that the director told you to try and outperform everybody else well, that you know your stuff, so well, I'm yeah. impressed. Yes, he did. He said on the first day of rehearsals, this is not uh, an ensemble piece. This is sport. There is a reason why we've cast you people. And the reason is that, th- that this will be sport. I want you to think of this as a gladiatorial contest. Now, my view on that is, A, that that was a masterstroke. It was Cal McChrystal, very, very brilliant director. Yeah. And B, that it didn't work because we needed at least another two weeks of rehearsal. But because it was an Edinburgh show, like the, the theory was brilliant and it was realised a few times. Uh, but we, need, we just needed a bit more rehearsal time. It was bloody difficult. Everybody's doing a play 
alongside other shows that we were doing. And no, not that we didn't try hard, we did. But but for everyone, they had their own shows because you were doing pretty much. I was doing two other shows. Yeah. Oh yeah, because you had early edition. I do the early well. edition every day, and then uh, my stand-up show, God Collar, as well. So, yeah. so that must have just torn it out of you a bit. It, it kind of did, but do you know what? I, mean, I sort of. I mean, I don't. Performing is tiring. You know, it is. You, you're giving something that, you, that you're not doing in most other jobs but I mean even a tough day at the office in Spamalot is, is two shows in a day alright it, it, it will make you tired but it's less than four hours work really yeah. you know and some people have real jobs <laughs> and so in Edinburgh because I have children I've, I take the view that if I'm going to go away for a whole month uh, I don't drink anyway, so I may as well be working and but getting worth something it. out of it, you know. And actually, the early edition is not work. I've never thought of it as work. It's how I would choose to spend a morning with friends anyway. Or get the papers. Let's just kick the news around and see what we can do. Obviously, it's for show, and so we're exaggerating our responses somewhat. But it's how I'd spend a morning anyway, and it doesn't drain me in any way. The play was kind of exhausting and an hour of stand up in that context with a brand new show is kind of knackering but no I was alright by the end at that time I was practicing um, Zen Buddhist meditation wow. and, uh, and do you know I really think it worked is that something you've kept up Are you no still... god it's so no. difficult <laughs> it's so difficult um, I think you should do it if you're going to do it do it with other people and is that um, what you did or no I was doing it on my own which I think is why I found it in the longer term more difficult, but it was certainly certainly rewarding. It's, it's good stuff, Zen. And there's no there's no mumbo jumbo in it at all. It's all about a breathing exercise and sitting and being still. There's not really any philosophy as such. Yeah, I think that's the thing with Buddhism is that it is yeah, and almost hypnotism to an extent. There's kind of a, an enigma around it, but when you boil it down, you're just you're sitting in a room and you're yeah. relaxing. And well, there are a lot of different schools of Buddhist meditation, and some of them include theories about um, rebirth uh, and you know magic people born from lotus flowers. But the Zen practice is that the Buddha was a prince who had a very um, safe and privileged lifestyle who then walked out into the world and was horrified at what he saw and struggled to deal with it and then found a system for getting through it. I mean, it's this is my story. <laughs> Do you remember, I mean, it, and, uh, in a very real sense, that, that I, I had a massively privileged uh, upbringing and then for various reasons sort of fell out of the protected world that I was living in. And was and, and remain horrified by much of the world that I see around me and have sought ever since to find ways of dealing with that. I mean, the Buddha, the Buddha sat very still and thought as little as possible and uh, just about himself and, you know, blah, blah, blah. and so anyway, I, I, it really chimed with me because there's nothing magical in it, but it, it was helpful. Oh, good. But yeah. well, the thing, I mean, living, having a privileged upbringing and then feeling like you've got to say something is that yeah. how you got into stand-up is that no I got into it really I mean that that, them, that, that might have been there underneath but it's possible I don't know I got into it really because I'm a great big show off <laughs> and I wanted to go to drama school I wanted to be an actor I was very did you? No, well, yes and no. I have been to drama school and I have studied drama in various places uh, and I have had a fair bit of acting coaching once you put it all together. But I didn't get the place at Central that I had absolutely assumed I would get <laughs> because I come from a privileged background where expectation is... Uh, is you'll just get it. Just, of, course, of course you'll get it because... <laughs> you're you. Because, I, because everything... <laughs> and this is... The, our, our leaders are these people. So okay. yeah. this is what my next show is about. But anyway, um, so no I didn't get in there and then I quite quickly realised that if you can create your own stuff then you're allowed to perform you can gig mm. and I started gigging before, just before I came to Bristol in 95 I came here and then my focus very quickly went right okay I need to go not only to a university but to a really good one where I will meet people who I can do this with and so I came here with that in mind. That was my sole purpose. 
and I walked around Bristol with a green suit with a goldish waistcoat and quite big boots on and I had um, business cards printed I'm awful, awful. <laughs> and I handed them to people who I thought were funny and went look um, it's all a bit awkward I'm not in a hall of residence I, I, I live in a little flat um, but anyway look this is me and I'm sorry about this I know how awful this looks but please call me because I just want to meet people and do the work so on the one hand I was big green suit going here's my card yeah. and on the other hand I, I, I was genuinely like please help me have places where I can be funny please 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 and I met um, Dan Texel and Danny Robbins who I still work with and are two of radio and television's most successful comedy writers and performers and you know so uh, ghastly though it was it, it worked it's paid off yeah 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 so I came I came here with that with that in mind and then realised once I got to Bristol within the university I put on a new show every term mm -hmm. Uh, usually a new-ish stand-up show <laughs> as much as I could write always a new sketch show improv shows and bits in between and then I got comparing gigs around the city and that was it really you know and then I was like well I'm performing four nights a week now yeah. sometimes two or three shows in a night um, and so the acting thing sort of took a slightly second place okay. now that I'm able to write bigger shows do a two-hour tour you know, and then uh, that's the show rather than the whole tour lasting two hours. <laughs> um, I can then take a time away from stand up to, to do the acting that I really love. Yeah. You know, so. so it's still a real love for you, the acting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it really is. It's a big thing. Yeah. And do you get a thing where you become the character? Is that a sort of method y thing? Well, yeah, yeah. Is it. Because I, I suppose some stand-ups, they, they get into acting, they haven't had your yeah. background, maybe. Right, yeah, and yeah. And it, it's kind I'm of an not, extension I'm of I'm not method, I'm not. <laughs> uh, by no stretch of the imagination. Um, but, like in the last serious play I did, which was The Railway Children... Oh, you did that? Did yeah, you? I played Mr. Perks and the Railway Children and at that Waterloo was in London. In Water was that for the whole run? Uh, no, I did about four months. Oh, wow. Um, so, long. yeah, yeah. I, I did find in that, um, this would be ghastly for people. <laughs> <laughs> so, what a wanker. Uh, but um, I did find in that all manner of internal stories that I never shared with anybody else because it wasn't the point. It was they became interesting things for me I, and quite simple stuff that Mr Perks who is the um, Bernard Cribbins character from the film this sort of slightly gruff um, northern station master takes it upon himself to look after the children who've arrived from London and are lost and their father is missing and all I did was create a story that when I'd been away fighting in the, in the Boer War that I, w I had been aware that Mrs. Perks and our massive family of, uh, of <laughs> multiracial children, which is another thing, um, would have been left behind. And that, that was the motivation for Mr. Perks, to look after these children. And it wasn't the point mm -hmm. to tell anybody else about that, but it was, I was in the war, I missed my family, and I knew, because I loved Mrs. Perks, how hard it was for her and for the children when I was away. And so... That's not method by any stretch of the imagination. It's simply, you know, what's my motivation? But but you've got to have that for it to be believable. Yeah, don't you? yeah, 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 yeah. So. And I don't. Perhaps I should, and maybe I will next time round. I don't go slavishly hunting for those things during rehearsals. They come if they're natural, mm. you know. I don't. And I don't want a director really to sort of. So, you know, to Sit say what's my you. motivation. Yeah. I do. I do take the view. You know, well, why is my character saying that? Because um, it's written here in the script, <laughs> and I think as because because I've written so much stuff, then there is that. You know, I mean, obviously I've worked collaboratively on lots of scripts, and have have someone go, I'm not going to say that, and you either go, yeah, no, you are, because I need it for that, or you go, all right, then, because you don't care. You know, either matters or it doesn't. But for the most part, you're handed a script, and it's like, well, you say it because it's written down. Yeah. But do you have a thing where you have to be saying it for the first time in your head? That's something Oh, yes. Well, yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I don't learn my lines before rehearsals. 
I, okay. I, 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 I <laughs> couldn't and wouldn't. I mean, I, I could technically. Isn't that frowned upon though? Yeah, probably. And I don't <laughs> care in the slightest. I want my lines to be locked into the action with other people. Mm. If I have a big monologue, then I'll learn it because it's me on my own, and I'll do it in a mirror or something. But I want the way that I learn the lines to go in in conjunction with the people I'm working with because that's what makes sense of everything that you do and I find it difficult if I I think because of the comedic sensibility actually if you learn a line you think oh that's how that's done then that happens a certain way and actually it happens it happens a different way depending on what the other actor is doing can you um, change it though like with Spam a lot at the moment can you to keep it fresh can you do something different with it or does it stay largely yeah I mean yes the, the script with Spam a lot is uh, 98% totally locked right and it depends on it staying totally locked and it's single words are crucially important and, and we say them as Eric and the other Pythons wrote them there are other bits that change and there's a very clear delineation in the script if I had one here I could show you where no, no, that doesn't matter you change that well, it doesn't matter because nothing else depends on it but everything else is a certain way also with Spamalot you have people come to see the show who are singing along with the spoken bits because it's Python Right, they know yeah. it and they want it a certain way and obviously Eric's taken huge liberties and plucked lines <laughs> from sketches that he likes and put them into the script which is variously pleasing and horrifying for Python fans mostly pleasing Yeah, but no there's not much pissing about in it and none at all in the Railway Children it wouldn't yeah. change anything I mean I suppose that's a bit more difficult isn't it I suppose it's just it's just keeping it fresh isn't yeah. it just trying to make it I mean I got a couple of lines in Railway Children yeah. Uh, which I, I did I sort of played around with in rehearsal and then I waited until the writer was there didn't say anything and just did them and then quietly went up and said I don't know if you noticed but I did a couple of things and you must say whether they can stay or not because it's his piece right you know? yeah. and as it happens I think two stayed and the other one went but they were that was a tiny little thing I suppose that's the thing you do have to respect it totally because it's somebody else's piece of work otherwise why it? do it Mm. Go into a thing as a as a as a collaborator and change it all. Why not? Mm. But if you're employed as an actor, unless there's an understanding in the rehearsal process that this will be a collaborative reimagining of something or other, then you take what's given. Really. Does there come a point though you get bored of it? Like I mean, the Railway Children was four months, and you've been doing spam a lot now. Yeah, like off and on time. for a long, long time. Yeah. No, it doesn't get boring, but Spamalot is a show with, uh, um, it's, uh, what's the right metaphor, but it's a bouncy ball, you know, like, you throw it, and if they're all spongy and floppy, nothing comes back, and that's not boring as such, it's more, it angers me, <laughs> uh, as many things do, but, um, that's no, not boring. It's really just like, oh, oh, the fucking theatre haven't told enough people we're here. Mm. And this is a 2,000 seat thing and there are 400. And bless them, they're trying their best. But you know what? Without laughs, this is just some words mm. in, a, in an inconsequential piece of frivolous, childish, Python-esque comedic nonsense it needs to have them on board and yeah but last night creative. yeah last night god you know just put lines out there and this whoomph of a laugh comes back and it's brilliant it's brilliant I mean and that's coming back to like the starting point for it that is the part of me that is 100% a tart <laughs> is I am I am so reliant on that process I mean I wrote a book last year and I found I have found it rewarding to hold in my hands those sheets of paper that I wrote but for the most part I found that experience dismal because I got nothing back nothing. Is that the main thing you did all year then? Or? Um, yeah I, I suppose it was I mean I was touring Spamalot I very merrily said to the to the uh, publisher yeah do you know what I'm on tour so working nights a lot of daytime we'll get it Lots done by time. then 
Yeah. It doesn't work like that. It just doesn't. <laughs> so I wrote quite a lot of it while I was on tour and then really wrote it afterwards when deadlines were whizzing past me. But, yeah. Right. So you, And you had to sit down and really kind of make yeah. something of it. Yeah. But I mean, that's... I finished God Collar, the show, and then I didn't want to do it as a DVD. Yeah, now why was right. that? Well, the show was, for a kickoff, very, very personal to me. Very personal. Mm-hmm. The end part of the show, well, the very beginning and a long chunk at the end, was about my friend, my best friend who died uh, very suddenly, leaving two very young children and the, the massive aching hole that had left in my life and how it had made me not believe in God or turn to any faith as such but wish that somehow I could do that Yeah. Uh, and it made a lot more sense of why anybody would choose to believe in faith just the, this straightforward trade off between this really hurts this in theory makes it hurt less I couldn't I couldn't pull off the lie, and I do think it's a lie. I don't mean for that to be disrespectful to the, those who do, but I do think it's a lie. I couldn't pull it off, so I couldn't make it work. Yeah. So it was very, very personal, and I allowed myself, or pushed myself actually, to emotionally engage with a deep, deep sense of sadness at the end of the show. And I mean, a lot of people who watched it, I'm happy to say, found it very funny first but also said that they cried. I mean, the guy who reviewed it in The Telegraph cried, which is kind of amazing for a stand-up show. Did, was it emotionally draining for you as you were doing yeah, it as it well? Yeah, it was. It was full on. There were certain places, like places of, of greater significance for me, where I'd get to that bit in the show, and it was literally like... Yeah, it was a huge... You know, I, I cried. It was yeah. as simple as that, I suppose. Um, so there were certain sort of watershed moments, like the first show in the West End. It was like I'd, I said a line that I that I hadn't said before. I was talking about James, and I I said he'd have loved this, and just pointed generally at the fact that I was in a West End theatre. And from then on in, was was it was <laughs> just I was yeah. hopeless because yeah. I thought, you know, he really would, he really would have loved it. So for that reason, and because. Uh, have you seen much decent comedy on YouTube recently? Um, Bits and pieces? Well, have you yeah. seen some comedy on YouTube Yeah, recently? I have. Yeah. Right, okay. Me too. Loads of it, and I love it. And I love the bite-sized nature of it. Okay. And I am yeah. so glad that none of my show is available in that form. Yeah. Because... It's a whole piece. Me, exactly. And I don't want that to sound wanky, but I, it, it matters to me. I don't give a toss if you're a Muslim and you decide that you're deeply offended by what I've done or a Christian or a Jew and you decide that what I've done is is beyond the pale and all the rest of it if however you've arrived at that decision because you've heard a couple of lines from my show um, then that really bothers me you are totally entitled to have heard the whole thing and go screw you mister you are wrong (laughs) Uh, it's a reasoned judgement it's not yes yes and you know what the letters of complaint or emails of complaint or, or occasionally direct um, uh, complaint after the show, which were fairly rare given the context of the show, um, were all totally reasonable. I mean, I had a, one letter in particular from a Muslim couple who'd been, who were really cross, and wrote it down in a letter as most normal, decent Muslims would choose to do. They and didn't threaten me. Yeah. No, it was coherent. They didn't threaten me. They didn't They didn't tell someone else in order to have them threaten me. They did what most decent, normal Muslims would do, which is, uh, well, I didn't like that at all. I think I'll write him a letter. And he's telling me um, about yes, it. Yes, yeah. yeah. And I thought, well, that's a very fair exchange, you know. Yeah. And, you know, I I had the same from some Christians, many of whom said, oh, you know, we really like this, this and this. Obviously, I parted company with you on that. But a lot of the issues that I raised were ones that they seem to have a lot of problems with themselves, you know. So, yeah. It was kind of a stage of you becoming... Was that a stage where you became more of a nice atheist, in a way? Or... Was well, there that to fall? Yes, maybe. No, maybe. I mean, I was, I was for a while on the Dawkins bandwagon thing. And are you totally off that now? No, I'm or? not. In that, in that, I think that, that Professor Dawkins is is a, is utterly brilliant, and I'm really glad that that clear mind and that crisp 
articulation of scientific research, data, and and some opinion is out there. Yeah, I I happen to find it for my own tastes lacking in empathy, and I. This is a slight perversion, but anyway, I think that scientifically speaking, Professor Dawkins and a few other atheists ignore something which I think is scientifically relevant, which is that whilst there may be no proof for a god, I think too little emphasis is given to the value of faith for the individual believer. Okay. I, for myself, would remove faith from every aspect of public life. I want all religion removed from all schools, all the rest of it. Not, not educationally, I think it should be taught, but it shouldn't be in government anywhere, it shouldn't, you know, blah, blah, blah. But um, I think there is a, a keenness amongst some atheists to gloss over the reward, because it isn't as simple as even how I began saying, you know, upset here, a big lie here. The trade-off is much more complicated than that, and there exists across not all, most um, most societies in, in humankind um, that desire, that yearning for something. You know, we're really complicated people. Yeah, humans. We're we're uh, <laughs> we're needy and, and sad and happy and, uh, and complicated and capable of. Um, of doing things that our consciences make very difficult for us to carry out. Okay. And we, and we all do these things. We all do nasty little things. Sometimes on our own, sometimes to other people, um, you know, about which we feel shame or whatever. And, uh, and those things are difficult to deal with. And science probably has an answer for all of them, but, you know, finding it through science is... is a, is necessarily difficult. But there is a yeah, that there is a significance in hmm. in religion as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know whether my atheism, as such, is nice or seeks to be under, <laughs> understanding of anything. It, it, it's simply that I that it make it makes sense to me why people believe in in God. For many of them, I wish they didn't. Right. Uh, but it does make sense to me, you know. So you've taken a break from stand-up for quite a while. Yes. But are you going, yeah, are you going back too long. to it? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, I am doing it now. So it's still really important. Yes. Oh, God, yeah. And had I not written God Collar, that time would have been spent creating the next thing. But writing it as a book obviously took up that time. And, and it's been a long time focused on that one thing. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. And I'm glad that's done with now. Right. I keep it's running annoying. into... Well, I keep running it as I create the new show. I keep running into areas uh, that, that connect with religious themes and go, oh, God, I don't want any part of that. And <laughs> I will, completely well, I am it. making an effort to keep it out, but I don't think I'll manage to, <laughs> because it's become, inevitably, it's become a big part of it's what I do. Thing, yeah, 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 and it's, it's really important. I mean, you know, Baroness Warsi just kicked off with a load of old bollocks about militant atheists and stuff mm. like that, and, you know, in essence, what she's saying has a point, but where she was coming from in that the context of, of what I believe she was saying I, I think is entirely wrong so some of these issues need to be taken on but no the new show is it's called The Briggs Society do you see what I've done oh, very very clever <laughs> and I put a letter R in um, but it what it is is um, imagine for a second that the big society idea is something more than a horrible veneer painted over a horrific psychopathic um, series of ideologically driven cuts uh, imagine for a second that the big society is actually a really good idea uh, and it's not too hard to imagine that because I genuinely think it is a tremendous idea to reconnect people on a local level with a more local politics with a, a society connected to itself is precisely the world that I want to see. However, <laughs> the kinds of people who want to set up a school or a hospital or a society, for the most part, 
fucking horrible. <laughs> not all. Not all. There are a great many people who were volunteering before this, yeah. who continue to volunteer, who are very cool and very nice and all the rest of it. But the application of a big society thing uh, is necessarily brilliant. So the show is seeking basically to say, right then, let's have it. Let's have the big society and what should we do? What should we make? How can we decide the ways in which our, our societies where we live can actually work? Like, do you want to talk to your next door neighbour? Do you know him per? Any idea? I don't. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, but I want everyone else to. Yeah. You know, um, so there's all of these sort of contradictions in, in the ways in which I wish people were connected, but then my own inability and my own social awkwardness absolutely prevents me from, from doing it. So I'm really excited about it, and it's, it's allowing me to use this big society thing as a great big fishing net for ideas, uh, which include the absolutely mundane and trivial. For example, the people who work out how much our economy loses when we have a bank holiday should, in my opinion, be enslaved by those of us who wish to have a bank holiday and made to work for us. Because if that's how they want to spend that Monday, yeah. then screw them. <laughs> they don't deserve the time off. I want the time off. I'm going to take it. And I'm speaking as a man who doesn't have to observe a bank holiday anyway because it makes no difference to me. So from the very trivial like that, through to, well, what have they done to the NHS? What will be left of it? How can we make sure that people with a need will be well served by it? How can we make sure that places in which education is neither a priority for the, the council, the parents, or the schools themselves, uh, how can we make sure that those kids stand a chance? The things that I think of are as immensely important. Okay, well, I hope so. We'll see. Look forward to we'll it, see. and that's in Edinburgh, is it? It's st uh, starting in Edinburgh and then touring uh, until uh, until I grow tired of it <laughs> <laughs> for as long as yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, actually, I mean, the show is yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. or a TV show, maybe. I, I don't know, radio Another show DVD? or something. DVD, perhaps. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? And I, I'm not. The money was lovely. I'm not totally convinced, for the most part that DVDs serve stand-up particularly well. I am convinced, by the way, that stadiums don't, or stadia <laughs> yeah. don't. I mean, I saw Michael McIntyre at the O2. Yeah. Brilliant. I mean, my God. He worked it really He works well. the room. Like, he actually plays the, <laughs> the room. But I do think that if you're doing stand-up and you're heckled by the back row, you ought to be able to hear it. Yeah. I think that, that for me, would be the cut-off point. Um, yeah. I'm not in that position and if I were and I were offered that kind of paycheck I might go oh, screw them <laughs> uh, they can post the heckles afterwards but generally speaking I think stand up lives at its finest in an intimate yeah. and in a somewhat intimate you know I mean the, uh, the, the Apollo at Hammersmith is a great place for it you know mm. it's really good so anyway we'll see but the show has a bit of crossover with the Mark Thomas manifesto because okay. Mark was asking people right what do we want then and this show is broadly speaking doing the same, which puts a lot more focus on me to actually write it. I can't get away with kind of like, go on then, what do you want? And crowdsourcing it. Not that Mark just did that, you know, this show was brilliant. But uh, so I'm slightly writing it against that. But yeah, I'm really excited about it. And it's nice to be doing stand up again, you know. I have a need. <laughs> Thank Thanks you very for this. much. Thanks for the tea. That's great. No, very no, nice. you're very welcome. I had no spoon. I had to stir it with a knife. <laughs>